uh, for anybody who needs a printed copy. So we will continue with Nectar of Devotion. Chapter 15, Spontaneous Devotional Service, one of my favorite subjects. Srila <clears throat> Rupa Goswami is trying here to describe the different achievements of the impersonalists and the personalists. Generally, those who are impersonalists and are inimical to the Supreme Personality of Godhead get entrance only into the impersonal Brahman when and if they reach spiritual perfection. The impersonalist philosophers are in one sense like the enemies of the Lord because the out-and-out -out enemies of the Lord and the impersonalists are both allowed to enter only into the impersonal effulgence of the Brahma Jyoti. So it is to be understood that they are of similar classification. And actually the impersonalists are enemies of God because they cannot tolerate the unparalleled opulence of the Lord. They always try to place themselves on the same level with the Lord, and that is due to their envious attitude. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has proclaimed the impersonalists to be offenders of the Lord. The Lord is so kind, however, that even though they are his enemies, they are still allowed to enter into the spiritual kingdom and remain in the impersonal Brahma Jyoti, the undifferentiated light, undifferentiated light of the Supreme. Sometimes an impersonalist may gradually elevate himself to the personal conception of the Lord. Bhagavad Gita confirms this. After many births and deaths, he who is actually in knowledge surrenders unto me. By such surrender, an impersonalist can be elevated to the Vaikuntha Loka, spiritual planets, where as a surrendered soul, he attains bodily features like those of the Lord. So try to understand this uh, impersonal conception of the Supreme is actually an offense. It's actually bogus. It's actually bogus. How could there be an impersonal spiritual energy or effulgence without some person to emanate it? I mean, this is just impossible to understand. No? I mean, people in the material world are conditioned to think that persons like us have somehow evolved out of some impersonal energy like atoms or space or gas or something like that. But that's complete nonsense. Okay? We don't ever see any instance where you take a bunch of chemicals, huh? like you can analyze a human body, huh? so many percent hydrogen, so much percent oxygen, so much percent silicon, carbon, so many other elements. So if you mix those elements together and you shake them up real good, huh, and you open the pot, the top, it, does it, a kid come out? No. No. Where do kids come from? They come from people. Where do persons come from? They come from persons. You see? We don't ever see persons coming from something impersonal. But we, we do see impersonal things coming from persons. That's a common thing. Huh? I can take a, some wood and some nails and I can whack something together and uh, make a chair or a fence or a barn or something like that. So the barn, that's impersonal. But I'm a person. So because I'm a person, I have the intelligence to take these parts and put them together into something that makes sense. So if you see something wonderful, like the Brahman effulgence, for example, it has to come from a person. Huh? Nothing impersonal can create itself. It just doesn't happen. When we see things that are impersonal going through different changes, it's because some person has set in, uh, in motion a process that makes those changes happen over time. 
That person is called God. Huh? Just like if I take huh, uh, some water and I put a little dirt in it and I cover it up and I put it in the closet. Then a few days later I take it out and I look at it with a microscope. There's all kinds of little creatures swimming around. Huh? Did I create that? No. No. The uh, eggs or seeds or whatever uh, of those creatures were already present in the dirt. And when I put it in water and gave it some time to ferment, it simply brought out those eggs. They hatched and they started swimming around actively. See? So when we see something like that, we, we might say, well, those, these living creatures are coming from something impersonal, the dirt. No, actually, there were living creatures before that, and then they made those eggs, or they went into, like bacteria could, or uh, paramecium, and like that can go into like a chrysalis form when they dry up. And then when the water comes, they again become active, like that. So similarly, when we see the material world going through all these changes over time, it's because God has put this process into, into motion. He's given the original impetus, the original emanation. And now it's going on by uh, the force of time. But time is itself an intelligent thing. Huh? Just because we don't understand it, just because we're not intelligent enough to see the complex fractal shape of time. Huh? But we can understand a little bit if we study astrology. Who's up on the, somebody's up on the roof? A bird, probably. Oh, I see. Um, if we study astrology, we can understand that certain events repeat over and over and over again. And we see similar events in many, many different people's lives. Uh, I can tell you if I look at your chart and you're going into Saturn period, unless you have a very, very strong placement of Saturn, oh boy, you're going to be in trouble. Better start doing your sadhana. <laughs> I mean, that's the only cure. Otherwise, you're going to be miserable. I mean, you're going to be miserable anyway, so you might as well do your sadhana and that way, because you're not going to enjoy, you know, you're not going to be able to party. So <laughs> just uh, start chanting. That's the only way out. The way out is the way through. So this is time. And the force of time is there, and nobody can counteract it. This time potency comes from Krishna. He says in Gita, time I am. Huh? So he's creating, maintaining, and destroying. That's his role. And we are just riding along on this machine. He calls it in the Bhagavad Gita, he calls it a yantra, a machine or a design, a pattern made of material energy. So the impersonalists, they want to say that uh, something personal or something living can come from something impersonal. Huh? But we don't ever see this. There's no evidence to support this. Huh? We see that persons come from persons. And impersonal things also come from persons. So also the Brahma Jyoti is coming from person. This nonsense impersonal philosophy got started about 2,000 years ago, or a little less than 2,000 years ago, with Shankaracharya. There is a bona fide Vedic uh, uh, Brahmavadi impersonalism. But that impersonalism leads to the realization of Paramatma and the personal form of the Lord. See, the nonsense impersonalism is called Mayavadi, Maya, they call Maya bodies because they think that the form of the Lord is Maya. It's illusion. This is so nonsense. This theory is, does not appear in the Vedas anywhere. Uh, Shankaracharya made this, this theory up about 15, 1600 years ago. And it was popularized by the British. The British made the Shankara lineage the uh, chief of all the religions in India. Why did they do that? Because they wanted to destroy, weaken and destroy Vedic culture. And they knew that this doctrine is very poisonous. 
So they made those guys the, the head of all the re administrative heads of all the religions under their government in India. And they called it Hinduism. But there is no such word as Hindu in Vedas. The word Hindu comes from Persian. Huh? So it's a foreign word. It's not a Vedic word. It's, uh, you know, they, the, and then the, the final blow was they made the study of this synthetic religion, Hinduism, a requirement for graduation from their university. So if you wanted to get a good job, you had to study it. So because of this, everybody in India is confused now about which is higher, the personal or the impersonal, you see? None of them go back and read the actual scriptures. They all rely on second-hand, third-hand, fourth-hand interpretations. They're lazy. They're lazy. They don't bother to learn Sanskrit or they don't bother to go 